to our first lecture on operators. The very first thing I'm going to do is create a project on C-Line, which is my chosen C++ IDE. I'm going to click New Project, name my project Udemy C++. I'm going to choose the default language standard, which is C++14. Uh, any of these options will be fine for our purposes, but I'm just using the default. And I'm just going to load this project. And it looks like c -Line has given us some default code, uh, a hello world statement. What I'm going to do is first create a configuration, which will allow me to run my code. So if you go to Edit Configurations, you click CMake Application, and it'll bring you to this screen. The last thing you need to do is change your working directory. And your working directory is essentially the directory where your code is stored. So I see that my Udemy C++ folder is right here. I'm just going to click on it, open, and I should be good to go now. I'm going to run my code and see if the hello world statement appears in the console. Oh, there it is, hello world. It looks like the configuration is working. So in this video, I'm going to focus on operators. Operators are things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, etc. Things that you tend to do with numbers. And there are some other more sophisticated operators, but in this video, we're going to focus on the basics. So the most common operator is addition. So you might see something like 2 plus 3, and you just do it just like traditional math the same way you'd see in um, other programming languages like Python and Java. So if I have 2 plus 3, C++ will evaluate this expression to give me 5. I'm going to run my code, and there it is, the number 5. I'm now going to do the same thing with subtraction, and I expect I should see a negative 1. There it is, negative 1. Multiplication works the same, 6, and then division. Now division is a bit more complicated in C++. It works differently when you have two integers that divide cleanly, meaning there's no remainder, versus when there is a remainder. So in this case with a 6 and a 3, it should uh, give me a 2, which is just what I expect. However, if if I choose a number that does not divide evenly, then I will get a decimal. So let's see what happens when I divide 6 by 4. I got the number 1. So that's pretty alarming because 6 divided by 4 is equal to 1.5. So I need to figure out what's going on here. The thing is, in C++, when you divide two integers, it'll always give you an integer, which means the number 1.5 is truncated to the number 1. It essentially just takes that decimal and deletes it. That's why if you want to divide two integers, you always need to cast to a double. A double is a data type that is used to represent floating point numbers, which are just numbers that have decimals. So in this case, I need to cast either of the numbers, I'm going to choose number 4, to a double. And I just write double and surrounded by parentheses, and that'll cast the number 4 to a double. So let's see what I get in the console now. There it is, 1.5. By casting the number 4 to a double, I'm telling C++ that I want, any, I want the result of this calculation to also be a double, because it'll assume that if you're working with decimals, you're probably going to get a decimal as a result. So this is one thing to, to uh, think about when you're doing division with integers. Lastly, another operator that's commonly used is the modulus operator, which is represented by a percent sign. This is the remainder after you divide two integers. So the remainder of dividing 6 by 4 is 2. Let's see if that's what we get. Yep, there it is, the number 2. 
So you now know how to use the most common operators, plus, minus, um, multiplication, division, and the modulus. Something to remember is that C++ evaluates expressions using PEMDAS, the same rules that we're used to following in math. So if you have something like 6 plus 4 times 2, you should expect this to evaluate 4 times 2 first, and then do the addition. So when I run this code, I should get 14. The order of operations still hold, and the modulus has the same preference precedence as multiplication and division. You may be wondering about exponents, whether C++ has a dedicated operator for exponents. Uh, it turns out it does not. So if you want to do exponents, you'll have to use a, uh, a library that has an exponent function that can do the calculation for you. All right, I hope you had a good time learning about operators. See you in the next video. Welcome to lecture 2 and we're going to talk about variables and data types. C++ has two types of data types. It has primitives and then it has more complicated references. So the primitive built-in data types are things like integers, doubles, uh, characters. Uh, they tend to be very simple. So if I want to declare an integer, I just type in int x equals so what this is saying is that I'm declaring a variable by the name x, it's of type int, and the value it holds is 3. Now in a programming language like Python, you would only write x equals 3, but in C++, uh, variables must be declared with their type. So this means that x will always store an integer. It won't store uh, a string, it won't store a double, only an integer. And this follows the same syntax you might be familiar with from something like Java. I could declare another uh, variable like int y equals 4. And it'll do uh, exactly the same thing. If I want to make a floating point number with a decimal, then I would have to declare it as a double. So I'll say double z equals 3.14. These are uh, the two most common numerical uh, data types, but there are some others, such as the character. So if I say char c equals, uh, I'll just say a, I'm declaring a character by the name of c, and it can only hold a single character. It can hold a letter, a number, or, or uh, a punctuation mark, but just one single character, and you denote it with these single quotes. And there's also booleans, which either are true or false, only two things. So a boolean will be declared with bool, I'll call it b, and I'll say it's equal to true. And I'll also make a one call um, not b, and I'll say it's equal to false. So these are the only two types of uh, values that booleans can store. And you can also uh, hold expressions inside a variable and will be evaluated when you run your code. So if I say int um, abc is equal to x plus y, then abc will then hold the value x plus y, which is 7. So I'm not going to print some of these variables to the console. But one thing I want to do first is add the statement on the top. I'm going to say using namespace std. What this will do is I don't have to write std between before every single print statement to the console. It'll just make the code a little bit cleaner. So I'm now going to uh, print abc to the console. And there it is. I got the number 7 just as I expected. You can also evaluate expressions of boolean. So I can say boolean um, expression is equal to um, b and for and um, how about not b and I'm going to print on expression so the and operator will check if both of these are equal to true but in this case not b is equal to false so x should be equal to false and 
and there you go, it prints zero. So in C++, the number zero is equivalent to false, and the number one is equivalent to true. However, in most programs, any number that is not zero will be interpreted as true. So you have zero is false, and then anything else, any other number is equal to false, is equal to true. That's something to keep in mind. So you might be wondering what kind of uh, names you can give to your variables. So the identifier must start with a character, but it can also hold numbers and underscores. So I can have underscores, I can have numbers, but I cannot have anything else. I can't have dashes, no punctuation marks, and it must be one continuous word, contiguous word. There can't be any spaces. And uh, lastly, I want to talk about defining your own custom types. So we have this keyword called typedef, which I can use to create a wrapper on another type. So I can say typedef int, and I'm going to call my type inches. So what this means is that I can declare variables of type inches, but it'll be essentially the same thing as declaring int. So if I say inches length is equal to 5, and then I print it out, I should expect the same exact behavior as if I declared this to be an int. There it is, number 5. So typedef is heavily used for more complicated types, but it is kind of cool to be able to declare your own types. Alright, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. See you in the next one. And welcome to our third lecture on strings. In our last lecture, we talked about characters. So I can declare caric C and I can make it equal to a single character, which could be a number, a letter, or a punctuation mark. So I can make this equal to A, or maybe I can make it an exclamation mark if I want, just anything that is just one character long. And I use the, the single quote to denote, denote this uh, variable. But what if I want to store something that's multiple characters long, like a word or a sentence? I have to use a string. And to declare a string, you have to write string and the name of your variable, I'm going to call this one word, and I'm going to make it equal to piano. So I've just declared a string object called word, and the content is piano, and I denote the string by using double quotes. So I use double quotes for strings, and I use single quotes for characters. And a string is very flexible. I can have as many characters um, as I want. I can have, you know, I can have one, I can have a space, I can have you know multiple multiple words, anything, anything works. So um, this is how you declare a string, and I can print it out. Oops. I can print it out the same way as I would with uh, any other variable, and here it goes. I see the word piano music. Now, this is what we call a C++ string. Sometimes in C++ code, you might run into something called a C string. And it's not very common, but just for the sake of completion, I'm going to briefly talk about C strings. So instead of a C++ string, which I've declared here, a C string is declared as follows. I write car, I have a star, which denotes a pointer, and I write the, the name of this, I'm going to call this um, variable c stir for c string and I'm going to say this is equal to um, hello. Now this is the, the syntax used for a c string and I'm just using this for completion just in case you run into any uh, c strings in your C++ code. But this isn't used very often and um, wh what you will be seeing is C++ strings. And C++ strings are mutable, which means you can change them after you declare the, the original string. So if I want to change this word, I can write word, and I can access the nth character. So in these square brackets, if I write you know, the number 1, I can say word 1 is equal to a, um, a, which is a character. So I'm changing the second uh, index in the string, and I'm going to reassign it to a. And notice how I have the number 1 here. This is because C++ uses zero-based indexing. 
So I have the number one here, but this is the second character. So let's see what the word uh, prints out now. There it goes. It says PAA now because I just edited it. So the second uh, letter is the letter A. Now the string object comes with a, a bunch of useful functions, but the one you're going to be using the most is called size. So if I declare um, an integer uh, variable, I'm going to call this int len for length. I'm going to say int len is equal to word dot size. So what I'm doing here is calling the size function of word. And this will return to me how long the particular string is. So I can count that this string is 5 plus 1 for the space and then 5 for the word music. So I should get 11. So let's see what len returns. There you go. It says 11. So it's a very convenient function when you're working with strings. And there you go. This is an introduction to strings. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next one. One and welcome back to this lecture on string methods. So in the last video, we learned about strings in isolation. But in this video, we're going to learn about things that you can do to play around with strings. So if I declare a string called piano, and I declare a second string called music, I can combine strings using the addition operator. So I can say string c is equal to a plus b. I'm now going to print the string c to the console to see what happens. I'm running my code. And there it is, piano music. And notice how there isn't a space between the two words. That's because there are no spaces in these two individual strings. So if I wanted to include a space, I would have to manually include it right here. So when I rerun my code with this addition, I now have a space. And there are cases where you might want to use maybe a quotation mark inside of your string itself. So if I declare a string called um, string t is equal to, I'm just going to say the word can't. Now this is perfectly fine because this string is surrounded by double quotes, so the single quote does not uh, affect you know, C++'s ability to parse this line. So what if I wanted to put a double quote here? Well, that causes an error because now C++ thinks that can is the entire string and this is just some rubbish. So in order for C++ to ignore this double quote inside of the string, I need to use an escape character, which is the, the uh, forward slash. So if I put a forward slash right before the quotation, C++ will essentially treat this just like a normal character. And now there it is, can't with a double quote. And notice how the, the forward slash isn't here. That's because it's an escape character. And the escape character um, does not show up in the real string when you're using it to escape like a double quotation, for example. And there are even more um, cool uses of escape characters. I'll show you another one. What if I want to use a tab between two words? And a tab is usually four spaces. So if I have piano music, but instead of a space I want a tab, I can just do escape T. And when I print out the string, now there's a tab between these two words. So this is just one example of how escape characters can be used to format strings properly. Now there might be uh, cases where you want to add something that isn't a string to a string. So let's say I have the string called score in a game. I have a space and then I want to add a number. Let's just say int score is equal to 5. I can't just do um, score plus s. That'll throw an error because I'm trying to add a string to an integer. 
I have to first convert this integer to a string using the toString function. Whoops. So by surrounding this integer with this toString function, this converts this integer into a string so I can add it properly to this other string called score. So when I run the code, when I run the code it says score is 5. So this is a good introduction to um, working with strings such as string concatenation with addition as well as adding non-string entities to strings like integers for example. See you in the next video. Welcome to this lecture on conditional statements. A lot of times in, in code in any, any programming language you want to have conditional statements so your code will only execute some parts of a block of code rather than everything. And this is important when your code needs to make decisions. I'll give a quick example of a conditional statement. If I declare two integers, I'm going to say int a equals 2 or 3 and int b is equal to 6. All right. So if I want to declare a conditional statement, I need to use the syntax word if. And you can see it's orange because it's a keyword. After the if, I have parentheses and then I have a um, curly braces to denote the block of code I want to be executed. And the convention is in each block of code you have to indent. So all the code inside this if statement will be indented. So inside the parentheses, I need to have a conditional statement, which is a Boolean value. It's either true or it's false. So one possible Boolean value would be a greater than b. So I'm basically asking, if a is greater than b, I want this block of code to be executed. I'm going to print out greater. And on the other hand, if a is not greater than b, so that means a is equal to b or a is uh, less than b, I'm going to have another statement. I'm going to write else if a is equal to b. I'm going to then print out equal. And lastly, I'm just going to say else. And then I'm just going to print out lesser. So in this case, only one of these three blocks of code will be executed. The code will first check, is a greater than b? This is false, because 3 is not greater than 6. So this will be completely skipped over, and it'll jump right here. And then it'll say, is a equal to b? Which is also false. So it'll skip over this block of code, and then it'll go to the very last block and say, if all of these other cases have failed, then this must happen else. So then it will print out lesser. And I'm running the code right now, and it sets lesser. And if I were to change um, the values of a, I could write something like, what if a is equal to 6? If I run the code now, it'll say equal. And if I make a equal to 12, then it'll say greater, because 12 is greater than 6. And the way conditional statements works is that you ha can only have one if statement and you can only have one else statement. But you can have as many else if statements as you want, as many as you want. So I'm going to now give a different example. I'm going to create a variable called age. I'm going to say, I'm just going to leave it as 12 right now. And I'm going to change this so it says if age is greater than or equal to, I'll say, 21, then I'm going to print out, you can um, drink alcohol. And then if age is greater than or equal to 18, I can say, you can vote. And I'm going to create another else of statement. Whoops. I'm going to say is age greater than or equal to 16, then I'm going to say you can drive. And then 
my else statement, which means that age has to be 15 or less. I'm going to say, you can play Minecraft. So again, in this block of, in this whole uh, conditional statement, only one of these different print statements will be executed. So I have age equal to 12 right now, so I know that this condition will fail, this condition will fail, and then this one, so the else will be run. And there you go, it says you can play Minecraft. If I were to change this to 17, then it says you can drive. And then if I made it 100, it now says you can drink alcohol. So this is a great example of how you can use if statements and else statements to dictate which parts of code you want to be executed, and it's great for different like decisions and stuff. Okay, see you in the next video. Welcome to this video on arrays. So we previously learned about storing individual values in variables, like I can store one variable in an integer, like int a is equal to one. But what if I want to store multiple values inside one variable? In that case, you would need to use an array. And you can think of an array as a list of fixed value that can store n items. And you can choose how long this, uh, this array can be. And the array is also the most fundamental um, structure for storing multiple values in C++. So I'm going to now declare an array of integers. And this is a syntax. So you first specify the type. The identifier, I'm going to call mine ARR for short for array. And you have the square brackets. And in the square brackets, you need to specify the length. So I'm just going to say, I want my array to be in length 5. I have the equal sign, and then I use curly braces, where each element of the array is separated by commas. So my array of five integers will just be like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, you can choose any values you want. And this is my array. Just as a test, I'm going to print out um, how about the second number to the console. So I should expect this to say, or it's the third number to the console because it's zero-based indexing. And the third number is 2, and good thing, that's what I got. And just like strings, you can override the initial values of your array. So if I want to change the third value to uh, the number 42, I can. I just do array of 2 is equal to 42. And when I read on my code, it'll print out 42. So something to think about is strings are just arrays of characters. And this array is just an array of integers, and you can make arrays of any type of value you want. Now, technically, when you're instantiating an array, you don't need to specify the length of it. Um, if you instantiate with all the curly braces, with all the elements right here, because the compiler will just read this and say, oh, it looks like you have five, so I already assumed that this is 5, but you should specify the length just for completion. And lastly, you might want to print your array to the console. So what if I wanted to print the whole thing out? So I just do C out array. Well, look what I got. I got this weird number in hexadecimal, which is base 16. That's nothing like what my array looks like over here. That's because this array variable is not literally storing these values, it's storing a pointer. And this is something that we're going to talk more about in the memory management section. But just be wary that if you're trying to print out the array as a whole, you can't just print it out the same way you would do with a, a normal value like an integer variable or a string. But if I were to print out the nth index, like the zeroth index, it works fine. So that's just something to worry about when you're uh, working with arrays. Hope you enjoy the video and see you in the next one. In this video, we're going to talk about vectors. In the last video, we talked about arrays, which is a very convenient way to store multiple values in one variable. But one drawback of the array is that it has a fixed length. 
And there's another one that we're going to talk about in the memory management section is that um, it's not always possible to tell how long an array is. But there is a way to overcome these drawbacks, and that is by using a data structure called a vector. A vector is just like an array, except it can dynamically change its size. So you can add elements, remove elements, and do a bunch of other useful functions with the vector. In order to use vectors, you have to first include the library in your code. So on the very top, you're going to write include vector with the angled uh, brackets. So now that we've included um, the vector, we can now declare a vector. And by doing that, we just say vector int and the name of the vector, I'm going to call it v. So this just declares an empty vector of type int. And we use the angled um, these angle symbols to denote the type we want to store. And this format is called a template. So we now have an empty vector of integers. So we should now add um, some elements to it. So I can write v dot push back. Whoops. Push back, and then I'm going to add the number um, 10. And I'm going to add like two more numbers. I'm going to add 10, 20, and 30. So when I do dot and then the function push back, this is adding numbers to my vector. So I'm not going to print out, whoops, I'm not going to print out to the console what my vector is. So I'm just going to write v, but notice how I'm getting an error here. It's not going to compile. The reason is the vector is not a supported object for the C out code. Instead, I have to access any of its elements. How about the, the first element? But now the code will run. So similar to arrays, it is kind of inconvenient how we can't just print out the whole thing at once. But using loops, as we'll see in future videos, there actually is a way to um, pretty conveniently print out vectors. But just remember that you have to actually access a value in order to print it out. Otherwise, the code won't compile. So I'm now declaring an empty vector and I'm filling it with three elements, and this is the first element. The cool thing about vectors is that it's dynamic, so I can add elements, I can remove elements, do whatever I want. So after this, I'm going to now remove an element. And removing an element is a bit more complicated than adding one. You write v.erase, and then in the parentheses, you write v dot begin begin and then you I'm just gonna write the, the integer n so this is a kind of interesting uh, format so to remove the first element you'd write 0 the second uh, element you'd write 1 and then third is 2 etc so I'm gonna remove the, the zeroth element the reason this is such a different notation than maybe you're used to in other programming languages is because um, the C++ standard library is based upon these things called iterators instead of containers. So when I write begin, that is telling this vector where the vector begins, and then whatever I add after it is telling the vector which element I'm trying to access. So this is a bit more inconvenient, but that's just how it's done in C++. So now that I've erased the zeroth number, I'm going to print out the zero to see what it is. And there it goes. The zeroth element is not 20 because I've removed the first original one. So this is uh, the video on vectors. It's a very convenient library to dynamically add and remove elements. It's much more flexible than the traditional arrays we talked about last video. All right. See you in the next video. Welcome to this video on loops. There's often a lot of times when you want to repeat a block of code multiple times. Sometimes you know how many times you're going to repeat it, and other times you don't know how many times. So the first type of loop is when you do know exactly how many times you want to uh, repeat a block of code. And it's called a for loop. So the syntax of a for loop is as follows. You write for, parentheses, and then you have curly braces with an indent to denote the code you want to repeat. So the for loop has three parts. First, you have an initialization where you initialize a counter variable. 
So a counter is almost always an integer, and you just write int i is equal to 0. I'm just going to call it i by convention. And you have a semicolon. The middle part is the condition that is going to be checked every single, uh, every single time the loop executes the code. So I'm going to say while well, i is less than 10. And then the third part is the, the, the incrementer, where you increment or decrement the, the counter. So I'm going to write i++. So after each uh, execution of this block of code, this condition here is checked. If the condition is true, it'll continue. If the condition is false, it'll break out and it'll go out of the block of code. So now that I have this, uh, this for loop, I'm just going to add uh, a printout statement with uh, the number i. And let's see what it, what it does. There you go. It's all the numbers from 0 to 9. And when the incrementer is 10 at the, the 11th loop, this condition is no longer true because 10 is not less than 10. Thus, it'll stop executing. So that's a for loop. Uh, this is a case where you, don't, you do know how many uh, iterations you want. So in this case, I wanted exactly 10. But there are some times when you don't know when your loop needs to end and in that case you would use something called a while loop and a while loop has similar um, syntax first you might want to define a index variable so I'm going to call this one int j is equal to zero and I might say while parentheses and then the curly braces again the curly braces are the code that's going to be repeated and the while loop only has one component it's just a condition I'm just going to write j is less than, I'll write 10 again. And then I'll put j++ at the very end as my incrementer. So one way to look at this while loop is just like a slightly restructured for loop where I have the instantiation right here. I have the condition, which is the same right here. And then I have the incrementer i++ and I have j++ right here. And then I can do um, whatever I want in this while loop. So I'm going to sum uh, all the numbers from 0 to 10. So I'll write sum equal to sum plus j. And at the very end, I'm going to print out the number sum. So uh, let's see what, what I get. I get the number 45. And number 45 is uh, the, the sum of all the numbers from uh, 0 to um, 9. And that's a very convenient thing to do. And in this case, I did know how many uh, iterations I want to do, but there's many times when you don't know. So this condition could be anything, really, that you want. So I could write something like while j mod 9 is equal to 2. See, this is a very weird condition. And you know, in some kind of, in some cases, I wouldn't even know um, when this would be satisfied. Um, so in that way, while loops are for the case when you don't know how many iterations you want to do. And lastly, I'm going to talk about how you can use loops with uh, vectors, which is the data structure we talked about in the last video. So let's say I declare a vector of integers called v, and I want to fill it in with some numbers. I could just write a for loop with uh, i, and I'll say i is less than 15. And then, oh, notice how the C line autofills with plus plus i. Plus plus i and i plus plus are essentially the same thing for for loops, for the purposes of for loops. They're slightly uh, different in a minuscule way that's not important. So don't worry about the plus plus i or i plus plus. And I can write I can write v dot pushback, so I'm just going to add uh, the number i. So what I'm doing here is that I'm populating this vector with the first uh, 15 numbers, and this code is very clean because I'm not painstakingly writing, you know, v dot pushback, um, you know, zero, and then I do you know one, and then I do two, I do three, etc. You know, that'd be a lot of work, and it's not very elegant. But using the for loop, I'm able to do it very nicely. Alright, this is our video on loops. 
and I hope you enjoyed it. See you in the next video. Come to this video on for each loops and loop control. Now, many times when you're writing code for for loops and while loops, you'll want to either break out of the loop or you might want to restart a loop depending on where you are in the loop. So loop control has two keywords. The first one is break and the second one is continue. So when you have the keyword break, that means you will immediately exit the loop and go to whatever code is um, below the, the loop. Continue will essentially continue to the next iteration. Wherever you are in the loop, it'll just stop right there and just go on to the next iteration. And I'm now going to give uh, an example of where to use these. So let's say I have um, some number and I want to find some really weird condition. So I declare a number like int a is equal to 55. And I'm just going to make this loop uh, continue forever. And while true is a idiom that you use when you want um, to break out of a loop at some point. Because technically this loop will go on for infinity, but I'm going to have a break statement in there to ensure that there will be a point where this, this loop terminates. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an if statement. I'm going to say if um, a mod 56 is equal to a mod, oh, never mind all this highlighting, it's just C line doing its thing. Um, and if like, I'm just going to make up some weird condition, like if a mod 56 is equal to a mod, um, how about 17? Then I'm going to break. Otherwise, I'm just going to increment a. So whenever this, this random condition is satisfied, which um, I have no idea when it will be satisfied, it'll break out of the loop. And then after that, I'm going to print out the number a to see just, just what is this number that satisfied this uh, condition. So I got the number 952, which is apparently the, the smallest number that satisfies this condition. And once this condition is satisfied, the break statement is executed and um, the, the loop is ex immediately um, stopped and the code goes down here. So that's how break works. I'm going to show you how continue works now. If I replace this with continue, then this will literally continue on forever because after reaching the continue statement, it'll go right back to the top, go down here, and then go in an infinite loop. So all continue does is go on for, uh, we'll, we'll just restart the loop from the top. And um, yeah, that's how break and continue work. And now I'm going to talk about for each loops. Now we, in the previous video, we talked about for loops that are indexed with a, a variable like int i equals zero, i, you know, so on, so on. But sometimes we don't want to do that. Let's say I have a vector of integers, I'm going to call it v, and I'm just going to populate it with um, the first 700 numbers. So I'm just going to write v.pushback i. So after this code, v will have the first 700 numbers. But what if I want to iterate through the, the vector v? I could easily do this. I could just write a for loop with j. j is less than v.size. And then I could say um, c out v and then index j, get the jth element, and then end line. So let's see what this code does now. There you go, I have the first 700 numbers printed out to the console. But there's a more elegant way of doing this, and it's called a for each loop. So instead of having this index, I can instead say for j colon v, I'm going to print out the, the, the value j itself. So I'm going to rename this um, called val. It'll be more clear then. So I'm just going to go through each element from beginning to end and then print it out. And this should have the exact same behavior as before. And it does. The first 700 elements are printed out. So this is a much more elegant way to iterate through a data structure like a vector because you don't have to do any indexing. It's 
much cleaner and um, it just looks better and it and it might uh, tell you more clearly what you're trying to aim in this in this given loop all right so in this video you learned about um, loop control with break and continue and then you learned about for each loop which is a much more elegant way to iterate through a vector all right thank you for watching see you in the next video hi everyone in this component of this course we're going to talk about memory management so in other programming languages like Python and Java, you don't need to directly manage your memory. Like Java, for example, has a garbage collector that will destroy uh, references and pointers that you create. And uh, Python is also similar in that, in that respect. But in C++, when you um, are working with memory, you need to manage it directly. And I'm going to show you what that means uh, in, in this component of the course. And it's a very important uh, aspect of C++ when you're working more with computer systems like things like operating systems or computer networking. And in this particular video, I'm going to talk about the size of function, which is uh, very important in uh, working with memory. So to introduce you to the size of function, um, let's talk about a simple integer. So an integer in C++, has um, exactly four bytes allocated to it. That means that four bytes of data are allocated in this computer program when I write this line of code, int a. And if I were to create a double, like b, the double is actually eight bytes. It's twice as big as the integer because it can hold a much larger range of different numbers. Uh, with floating point too, with decimals. So the size of function essentially tells you how many bytes a certain variable or or type holds. So if I print to the the console size of, and then I have um, a, I should expect to see the number four. And there you go, four bytes. And if I were to write b, I should also see Eight bytes because that's how many bytes a double is but more abstractly you don't even need to write a variable even though that's most commonly used you can just write size of int and just write the the, the type itself and there you go four I could do the same thing with double or or care care is one byte and there you go it's one so this is a, a very useful function that's used heavily in a memory management because it's often useful to know how many bytes a certain variable uh, holds. And another aspect that is pretty interesting is when you declare an array, let's say I declare an array with um, four different numbers in it. Let's see how many um, bytes that this array holds. So I know that one integer is four bytes, so four integers should be 16 bytes. Let's see. There you go, 16 bytes. So size of is extremely versatile because um, it, it directly tells you how many bytes that you're working with. And this type of functionality is is only in C++ and C and other low-level languages. It's not present in something like Java or Python. All right, thank you for seeing this video. See you in the next one. Welcome to this lecture on structs. So a lot of times you want to represent an abstract object like a person a place a thing and this object or or person could have many attributes that you want to store and it's very inconvenient to store everything as isolated variables in your program like like ints and strings you can't just have them uh, lying around uh, in, in a function otherwise it would get very messy really quickly and it's uh, more error prone and hard to keep track of things that's why c++ and and also it's um and C, with a bit of overlap, have um, something called structs, which is a very great way to kind of package information together to represent some kind of person, place, or thing. So this is how the, the syntax of a struct looks. You first write struct. You have your uh, curly break brackets to denote. Oh, sorry, you have to first have your identifier. I'm going to call this one person. So I'm now going to have a person struct that's supposed to represent what a person is in code. So 
I'm going to choose to have two um, two attributes. I'm going to choose age. So I'm going to have an int called age. And then I'm going to have a um, string called name. So these two, these two um, pieces of data represent a person in my code, in my program. And again, having having this all packaged into a struct is a much cleaner way than having having them just lying around. Otherwise, it would uh, become very complicated really fast. And now that I've designed my struct, I'm now going to create a, a person. I'm going to say person p is equal to, and you use the curly um, curly braces the same way you do with arrays, and you write the the values for these attributes in the correct order. So I have age first, and I have name. So first, I'm going to write the age, which is, um, how about 25? And then the name, I'm going to write Sergey. So I have my two attributes in order. And my IDEC line is pretty sweet. It, it says age and name here just for my convenience. And maybe your IDE too does. But remember, the order matters. So I've now created a person. And how do I access the different attributes? Well, I can just use the dot operator. So if I want to print the console the the, the age, I can write p dot age, and let's see what this will produce. Twenty five right here, and the same thing with name. Sergey right there. So I access whatever attributes I want using this dot operator, and then I just write um the name of the attribute and it will give it to me right there and um, there's different ways of, of uh, instantiating a or initializing a struct so what if I want another person called uh, Q I don't need to do the, the curly braces uh, format I can say Q dot age is equal to 15 I can say Q dot name is equal to France um, that's a perfectly fine way I can even uh, override it I can say Q dot age is equal to 75. That's perfectly fine. And um, again, structs uh, can be changed once you initialize them. And the last thing I want to cover is size of with the, uh, relation to a struct. So what if I use the size of operator on a on a struct? So I'm going to write size of person. Let's see what the code returns. I get 32. So I know an integer is four bytes, and I know a um, actually I don't know how many bytes a string is. So let's let's see how many bytes a string is. I'm just gonna add another statement down here. I get 24. So I have 24 bytes here, and then for this name, and then I have four for the for the age, and then this adds to 28. And you might be wondering, well, if if I have four bytes for age and I have twenty four bytes for str for string, why am I getting a size of of thirty two? How is this supposed to equal thirty two, huh? Well, there's something called padding. So when you define a struct, C plus plus is behind the scenes actually adding a bit more space to your struct in order to pad your your struct. So the size of the struct is a power of 2. So 28 is not a power of 2. So it's behind the scenes adding 4 bytes. So the total size of the struct is 32. Now if I made this person have um, this person struct have a size of exactly 32 or exactly 64 nothing would happen but um, if you are on a number that is not a power of 2 then behind the scenes uh, C++ will be adding this padding bytes in order to push it up to the nearest power of 2. So that's just uh, something to think about when you're, uh, when you're using size of with your struct of this padding bytes because um, they do make a difference. Alright, thanks for watching this video. See you in the next one. Hello everyone and welcome to this video on references. So references are a very important part of memory management in C++. So, you might have been wondering, when we reassign variables to other variables, what are we really doing? So, let's start with an example. Let's say I declare an integer int a is equal to 1. And then I declare a second integer int b, and that's equal to a. 
So I know b should also be equal to 1, but what if I reassign b to 2? I know b is equal to 2 now, but what is a equal to? Because b is equal to a and I just reassigned b, so does that also mean a is reassigned, or does that mean a still is something separate, it's still 1? Let's see. So I'm going to print out the value of a. And it is 1. This is because when we reassign uh, variables, the entire content of the variable is copied into the left-hand side. So the copy in memory of this integer b and the integer a are completely different. It does not matter what I change b to. Um, it could be different, it could be the same, it does not affect a. They're completely independent because the value is copied over. And this is a good thing in some cases, but it's also a bad thing. What if you wanted b to be somehow linked to a such that if you edit b, then it also edits a? There's many uh, times where this kind of situation would be useful. Um, in that case, you would need to use a reference. So in order to declare a reference, you have to use the ampersand, which is the and symbol. And you just add the ampersand right here after the, the data type. So I'm now declaring b to be a reference of type integer. It's completely different. Well, it's not completely different, but it is different than a normal integer. It's a reference. And what I'm doing is essentially reassigning the same variable, but like with a different name. So now if I change b, I'm also changing a. So think of this as essentially like making a carbon copy, but every time, every time I change the second copy, it also changes the original. Everything I do with b, if I say b is equal to um, 5, 400, whoops. Let me, if, if I say b is equal to 400, then a is equal to 400. Anything I do with b is also done to a because b is a reference to a, so they're basically the same thing for most practical purposes. All right, and this can work for, um, for other things too. So I'm going to make an example of a struct now. Imagine I make a person p is equal to um, a person is age uh, 20 and the name is Bob. So then what if I make a person q is equal to p and I say q dot age is equal to 50. So what's going to happen to p? Let's see, p dot age. Again, this is just a normal person. It's not a reference, so they're completely different copies. Every single thing here is copied into q. So whatever I do to q does not matter to p. But if I declare a person reference with the ampersand, now let's see what happens. It's 50 now, because anything I do to q does to p. So this is um, a very important thing in memory management, the distinction between normal variables and reference variables. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, see you in the next one. everyone, and in this video, we're going to be talking about pointers. So pointers in C++ have a reputation for being a bit hard to understand, but I feel like with practice and you know opening up your IDE and playing around with this, this code, then it'll really help you get a better understanding of what pointers do and why they're used. So let's just start with a simple example. Let's say I define an integer called a and it's equal to 3 or 4. Now, what a pointer is, is not a simple value like the number 4 or the number 10 or a string or a character. It's an address. An address in your computer's memory where a variable or something is stored. So I have a normal integer, but let's say I want an integer pointer. The syntax for a pointer is int, and you have an asterisk, star. So you have int star, and I'm going to call this a lock, or how about a underscore lock for a's, a's location. And in order to retrieve the address, you need to use the and character, the ampersand, at a. So be careful. A lot of these characters are, are used all over the place, like multiplication is used for this uh, pointer symbol, but you have to remember that 
this is the syntax of retrieving the address of a variable. In star of a of a's location is equal to at a. So I'm going to first print out the value of a, and then I'm going to print out the value of a lock. So we know that a will just return the number four because it's a normal variable. But what will a lock a's location return? Let's see. So we got the number four and we got this weird hexadecimal thing. So what, what does this mean? This hexadecimal number is an address in your computer's memory, in my memory, um, somewhere in your RAM that represents where this variable is stored, where these four bytes are stored of this integer. And you might be wondering, why do we need to know where in my computer's memory this, this variable is stored? Well, there's a lot of usages, especially in the upcoming video on uh, memory on the heap where this is extremely important and sometimes we might get this uh, a's location but we want to know what's actually there and in order to retrieve the value at the address you need to use once again the asterisk to what's called the reference a pointer so we have a pointer a lock and then I want to dereference it using the star and this will get me back my my simple integer. So let's see what this dereferenced pointer will return. And there you go, it returns 4 because I'm essentially dereferencing that crazy hexadecimal um, location and I'm getting the number 4. Now pointers are simple but they can also be complicated. So let's say I want the location of a location. So I get a's location's location, and then I do at a underscore lock. Well, I now have two stars because I have I have two layers of abstraction. That's one way to think about it. Because I'm kind of unwinding this another layer of, of where this pointer is stored. And so I have A's location's location with a double pointer. And I can I can do three, and I can do four, I can go on. But essentially, a pointer is an address. And to reinforce this idea, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up the size of function. So we know size of int is just four because an int is four bytes, but what about what about whoops, what about a lock? And then what about a lock lock, a's location's location? What do we think it's going to return with size of? And the answer is 8. So size of, um, of, of a normal integer is 4, size of a's location is 8, and then size of a's location location is 8. That's because a pointer is always 8 bytes. It doesn't matter what, whether it's an integer or a struct or it's a or, or anything, a double, anything is always going to be 8 bytes. That's just how the address in memory is representative, 8 bytes. So if this were a double, a normal double might be 8 bytes in memory, but the double pointer is still 8 bytes. Any pointer is 8 bytes, and that's a very important thing to remember. 8 bytes is an address. And yeah, that's a brief introduction to pointers. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next one. Everyone, welcome to this video on the new and delete operators. In this video, we will be learning about dynamic memory allocation. And in order to do dynamic memory allocation, we have to use the new and delete operators. Now let's talk about what dynamic memory allocation is. So in the last couple of videos, we talked about pointers. And pointers are a way of working with the location of a variable in memory. So when we declare a normal um, variable like int a is equal to 3, this variable is created on something called the stack, which is the area where all the local variables are created. And after this function ends, this function called main ends, this variable is then destroyed and the memory is freed. So if I were to create another function and try to access this memory, this variable a, I couldn't because a doesn't exist anymore once this function is over. But there are times when you want to make a persistent copy of a variable or an array or a struct. Um, and a persistent copy means that even after this function terminates, 
you can still access that um, piece of data that you can still access that variable or struct etc it still exists it's persistent and it will not be destroyed after this function terminates and this is more common in a very large programs when you have uh, maybe hundreds of different functions working with each other there's a lot of times when you want some variables or, or arrays to stick around for a very long time and in order to do that we can't just declare a variable like this because this type of uh, uh, variable is on the stack which is destroyed but there's another place we can declare a variable and it's called a heap and the heap is not destroyed and the heap is what we call dynamic memory allocation it means we have to do something different in order to tell C++ that we don't want this variable to be destroyed like all the other ones. So this is a normal declaration right here for um, declaring a variable on the stack but to declare a variable on the heap you need to use the new keyword new. So I would need to say int b is equal to new int oh sorry int star b is equal to new int and b is now a persistent copy of an integer. So you might be wondering, well, why, why am I using a pointer? Well, dynamic memory allocation is done entirely with pointers, which is what we talked about in the previous video. That's a design choice of the C++ creators. We have to use pointers when we're doing dynamic memory allocation. And when we're um, not doing dynamic memory allocation, we can just use normal variables, but this is just how it's done in C++. So I've now created a variable called b, an integer pointer on the heap, and I use the new keyword. So remember, if I want to declare a normal variable, I just write int a, but here I write new. All right, so how do I fill b with something? How do I make b equal to 5? I cannot just write b is equal to 5. This is incorrect because b is a pointer and as we talked about in the last video, if I print b out to the console, it's not a number, it's a location in memory. It's this crazy hexadecimal location in memory. So we can't just assign you know, b is equal to 5. That's not correct, so I'm changing the address. Instead, you have to dereference the pointer first using the star asterisk, which we meant, which I mentioned uh, last video. You star b, and then you say that's equal to five. So let me run this code again. And as you see, the address is still the same. It's this crazy number, but when I dereference this pointer. I will now get the good stuff, get what I filled this variable with. So always remember you got to dereference your, your pointers first before you fill them with whatever uh, values you like. And this uh, this integer b, this integer pointer is on the heap. So even after this after this function terminates, I can still access this number five. It won't be destroyed. And another thing to worry about is that. I'm just going to rerun this code. When you get data, when you get uh, an address in memory using the new operator, the C++ will just give you an arbitrary memory address that's open. So that means that whatever B could be filled with could be completely random. It could be anything. So always remember, you got to overwrite um, your pointers with whatever values you want. Otherwise, it could be something crazy. So when I commented this line out, b was equal to a zero, which is convenient, but it, it could technically be equal to any random number. Um, there's no way of knowing it could be completely random because C++ just gives me a random address. It doesn't fill, it doesn't zero it out or anything. So that is something to, to think about. So this can be done with um, other types too. I'm going to make a, a person pointer now. So I can say person star p is equal to new person and then I can say I want to make a, a person with age um, 15 or something and you might think that oh I, I should just do person that age is equal to 15 but this is incorrect because person is no longer a person struct it's a pointer to the person struct 
So we need to dereference it using the star operator, right? Correct, this is correct. I have to put the dereference symbol and then I can access the age. But there's a more convenient way to write this. But I'm going to first show you that this is the, the, the basic way. So just for completion, I'm just going to print this out with the parentheses. Got to remember the parentheses just to make sure this is working. And there it is, 15, just as I wanted. But there, this is kind of ugly to look at with these parentheses. That's why the C++ people created a more convenient way. They created the arrow operator. You write P, arrow with the, the dash and the, the, the greater than sign. And that's like the arrow operator. And you say P, dot, P arrow age is equal to 15. And this right here is exactly equivalent to this right here. Same exact thing. So I can comment this out. And it's, there it is, it's 15. So that's just something to remember whenever you're using pointers to struct, you have to use the arrow operator. Um, you could technically do the, the parentheses with the, the asterisk, but that's not as nice to look at. So they we have the arrow operator. And yeah, we can't use the, the period that does not work with pointers, that only works with normal variables. Okay. We're now going to um, talk about the delete operator in the next video. See you then. Welcome to this video on the delete operator. In the last video, we learned about the new operator and dynamic memory allocation. But there's an important part in this process that I didn't talk about in the last video, and it's using the delete operator. So here in this, in this code I have from the last video, I've created a new pointer, uh, an integer pointer called b, and I've created a new person pointer called p. But I'm missing something very important, and that's the fact that I'm creating a persistent copy and memory on the heap, and it's not going to be destroyed at the end of the function. So when is it going to be destroyed? Is it just going to remain there forever? Well, the answer is it will be destroyed at the end of the program, but during the program, it will remain forever as long as the program is running. So we have to use something called the delete operator to ensure that when we're done using it, it is destroyed. Otherwise, we're just wasting um, precious memory space. Uh, hy hypothetically, if you were creating a very large project with thousands of different uh, variables that could you know, eat up your RAM and you could slow down your program. That's why we have to use the delete operator. And the delete operator is very simple. You just write delete, Oops, delete and then B. And then for the person, you just write delete P. That's all you got to do. So, one thing to remember is that every time you have the new operator, you got to have the delete operator somewhere, somewhere when you're done using it. Otherwise, you're going to be using a precious RAM in your program. Every time you use a new operator, you have to use the delete operator. You can't have um, these pointers just roaming around in your program when you're done using them. That's called a dangling pointer. And it's a common uh, issue in many, many C++ programs because it just makes the programs uh, uh, run slower because they don't have as much memory. That's why you got to always delete your pointers. Now, notice that I don't have to delete A when I'm done because that's going to be deleted automatically. But these persistent copies do need to be deleted. All right. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next one. Hello everyone, welcome to this video on arrays and pointer arithmetic. So I have some code here from the last video where I'm creating an integer pointer and a person pointer on the heap. And then I talked about how we, when we, when we create a new uh, pointer, we gotta always delete it at the end. Otherwise the memory will just be lying around during the program and, and it'll just um, pile up if you were to make a really big program. Uh, otherwise it's not going to make an issue, but it is very bad practice to just not delete your, your pointers. So it's a good thing to always delete your pointers at all times. So in this video, I'm going to talk about arrays and pointer arithmetic. So this is the syntax to do to declare a single integer pointer. But what if we want to create an array on the heap? So instead of one variable, we can have like 10, 10 different things or 100. And the syntax is very similar. You still have the integer in star, 
I'm gonna call this array array r, and then you just write new int and then with the brackets with how many you want. So I'm gonna make an array with five. And you might be wondering, well, why why is this array pointer look exactly like the the integer pointer? Well, that's when pointer arithmetic comes in. When I'm going to access the, the nth item in this array, let's say I want to access the third one, so I'm going to do array 2, I have to then um, I have to then use the dot operator to, to fetch, oh sorry, not to fetch, not the dot operator, I have to use the equals operator to assign what value I want there. So I'm going to say it's equal to 20. And then I'm, I'm just going to print it out to the console just as, to make sure. And there you go, it says 20. So I have an array with five things and I'm assigning the second one. But when you're dealing with pointers, it doesn't matter if this array pointer is five values or if this single uh, integer pointer is just one value. This is just one number, this is five different numbers uh, contiguously. The reason is what I'm doing here is something called pointer arithmetic. This is the equivalent of me writing parentheses r plus 2 and then dereferencing it and saying that is equal to 20. And let's run the code to make sure that does the exact same thing. So what am I doing here? Why, why is this the same exact thing as this code right above? Well. What the square operator is doing is just adding 2 to this array and then dereferencing it with this asterisk right here. The reason is array plus 0 is the 0 with the number. That is array itself. Array plus 1 is the second number. Array plus 2 is the third number. So this square bracket is really just a, a cleaner, cleaner way of just writing this array plus 2 and then using the dereference with the asterisk. And when you're writing it in this fashion, it's called pointer arithmetic because you're essentially just performing arithmetic on top of a pointer with addition. So that's just something to think about when you're dealing with uh, arrays on the heap that they do look identical, technically speaking, to you know a single integer pointer. And the only way to be able to tell the difference if you, if you can't see it right here in front of your eyes is maybe you have to specify to yourself, otherwise it's impossible that they, they look exactly the same. And if you were to try to dereference a pointer that's non-existent, that's going to cause a bug in your program. So remember that whenever you're using um, arrays on the heap, make sure you add some comments to specify what you're doing, because the, the syntax is exactly the same as a single number. And um, And then I talked about how when I'm just accessing the, accessing the second element in this array, I have I'm essentially doing this pointer arithmetic, which is which is how the compiler is interpreting it. And just like any other pointer on the heap, after I use a new operator, I got to delete it. And to delete an array pointer, I just use the delete term with square brackets and then with the name of the array. So exactly the same as above, but now I just have to include square brackets. That's all. Exactly the same behavior. Alright, I hope you enjoyed the video.